Hello, I'm the Dark Master, and welcome back to the Kirby Right Back Atcha Retrospective. In today's episode, we'll be covering Episode 8, Curio's Curious Discovery, or as it's called in the Japanese original, Curio's Ancient Poo 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 Situation. Before I start the review proper, I want to address the darn claim that I got last time. From now on, I should be keeping the background of video to a minimum, and it shall be done only when needed. Luckily, this episode has far more to talk about, so it will be more than what some call a plot summary, like the previous one. Though then again, said critics don't really offer an alternative, so, yeah. Also, unlike the others, I struggle to find the English dub on YouTube, so please tolerate the slight decrease in visual crispness. Kinda odd how this is the case. At least Dailymotion has the entire series on it, so there's always that. The episode opens to a shot of Castle Dedede. There we see King Dedede walking out, bearing a crown design that would later be re-implemented into the games with a Kirby Superstar remake, Kirby Superstar Ultra, released for the DS. The similarities are just too great for this not to be the case. Also, Masked DDD has one of the best themes ever made for a video game boss. Just saying. The sound of horns and fireworks go off as Asker Goon announces that the king is a 17,000 52nd in his line. Okay, wait a minute. Now, obviously this is an exaggeration, but let's really break this down to show how absurd this claim is. Firstly, the longest known dynasty is the Japanese imperial family, who have an unbroken line going back to Emperor Kitai in the early 6th century AD. And it had a total of 125 emperors. King Dedede's alleged bloodline is thusly over 136 times as long as the longest known human bloodline. If we assume that each king lived the average human lifespan of about 79 years, then the Dedede dynasty has been in existence for 1,347,000 108 years, meaning Dedede's lineage dates back to when the bloody mammoths walked the Earth, assuming pop stars in the same universe as planet Earth, which, based on the game, seems reasonable. Even if each king only lived for the lifespan of a penguin, which is... 41 years, that still is 699,132 years, far longer than any human dynasty. The Japanese version is even more absurd, with Eskergu claiming that it has only been 300 years since the dynasty began, which means each individual king would have had to have ruled for less than a year. That's just absurd. Also, the Japanese version has these horns, which just, they sound terrible. I mean, like, seriously, what the fuck is this? <laughs> After Escargoon announces his announcement, Dedede walks from the shadows to give his speech that somehow 
makes Barney Fife look competent. I mean, in just a sentence, he insults his citizens twice. Like, listen to this. <laughs> My unworthy subjects, I'm tickled turquoise to see so many you good-for-nothings come to kiss up to your king. I in comparison, the Japanese version has a much blander statement. Despite him having no reason to be, the king is angry that no one came to his deprecating coronation with more than a dozen empty benches seen. He yells at Escargoon, who he believes to be responsible, and not his horribly incompetent rule that is like a heat rash upon anyone that suffers under it. Sir Ibram then points out that the citizens consider his legitimacy objectable, with Tiff pointing out how the Cappies were the ones to found Capitan, which, based on the name, seems to be far more likely than Dedede's supposed over a million year old dynasty. Or Tuff saying just because a leader claims to be legit doesn't mean he is legit, which is a good statement. Dedede, angry at the whole affair, yells deep into the sky, that there's only one king himself. And for some random reason, Ku flies by. In the Japanese version, he says nothing, so it's a bit odd. While in the English dub, he yawns in complete boredom, as if he's not even aware of what's going on. Why is he here? What purpose does he serve? I mean, I like the cameo, but it really does kind of kneecap the tone they were trying to go with with the intro. It's just kind of odd. After the intro, we cut to a, an archaeological dig site where Professor Kiro, Tiff, Tuff, and Kirby are all excavating various ancient Capri relics. Kiro, finding an airhead, shows it to Tiff, who then grabs her camera to take a photo of it, only to fall into a pit dug as a prank by both Tuff and Kirby. Now, how they soak cleverly covered up is a mystery to me, but eh, whatever, it's a form of conflict. Tiff, annoyed at the pair, not really helping, as they are just goofing off and really not being all that helpful. The English dub actually adds more dialogue to enhance how Tuff is acting, mischievous. In the Japanese original, he just remains more quiet. Also changed is Tuff's reasoning as he runs off. As in the Japanese version, he says he's Tired from boredom, which I am sure people can emphasize with. In the dub, he says he just wanted to have fun. He talks about how it's all old junk. Kyrie tries to explain to him how historical artifacts are important, but Tuff being a kid doesn't really care. Kirby being innocent doesn't really care at all and just tags along with Tuff as they run up a set of boulders. Tiff running after the pair falls into yet another prank hole dug up by Tuff. I know that her brother, she slams down her shovel and curses. One of the few times an expletive gets past the censors. Kind of cool it, it's to hear. I mean, honestly, censorship in general is just terrible in them. But I can understand why it's sometimes done. Anyway, as she slams her shovel down, they hear the sound of it hitting something. Oddly, Kirio seems kind of nervous and pretends to not have heard it. Though, clearly, he actually heard it. Foreshadowing. Being watched by all present, Tiff proceeds to dig up the artifact, asking for help from both Kirby and Tuff, who actually helped this time, at least for a little bit. After a few hours, much to Kirio's chagrin, they unearth a large stone coffin. In the English dub, she exclaims they have discovered a burial site of an ancient king. In contrast, the Japanese original has the much more hesitant statement of it merely being evidence of a cappy civilization prior to the current one. I prefer the English dub for two reasons. Firstly, Curious Home has hundreds of artifacts from various ancient Cappy civilizations, so it really shouldn't be all that earth-shattering. Secondly, it being a royal burial feeds into the wider plot and theme of the episode, especially when it connects to Dee, which we'll get to.
The three kids run off to tell the town as Professor Kiro remains behind, unusually nervous for such a momentous discovery. The townspeople later gather around the coffin, which Tiff views as evidence for an ancient Cappy civilization and disproves DDD's claims. But does it really? I mean, you can have multiple civilizations existing prior to one another and they don't delegitimize the rule of the current one, but we'll get to that. Said so, and this discovery yes. proves it for sure! Meaning King Dedede ain't really the real king like he tells us. That guy's nothing but a liar. Okay, so this is a problem with the episode. Hey, Hick, how'd you let Dedede get into power in the first place? And how does nobody remember time before the Dedede clan? Was there a war? What the heck happened? He, as far as we know, the only Dedede around. We see more of freaking Eskar Goon's family, for Pete's sake. Plus, you outnumber him. Overthrow him. Or wait for him to die out. As apparently, again, he's the only one around. Talk about a rabbit hole. I'll return to this later, but come the heck on. Didi then shows up in his tank, almost running people over. And you wonder why they despise you, King. Also, whoa Look, there's two tiffs. Talk about an animation error. Dee Dee is greatly annoyed that everyone showed up to see a moldy coffin, but not to see his royal coronation. Tiff then tells him that they found a real king, not a fake one, which is why they showed up. Dee Dee is, of course, rather annoyed at the insinuation, with a Japanese version even going as far to say, it will settle who the town belongs to. Dee Dee says the coffin's hogwash and that his clan has ruled since ancient times. Tiff, of course, calls his bluff and asks why they don't just open the casket and show the crowd wrong if he's so sure. The king, being in an unusually good mood, decides to agree to Tiff's challenge and goes up to open the casket. I guess he's being unusually good sporting today. Using a hammer, he strikes the lid and sends it flying. Man, Deity is strong when he wants to be. I mean, seriously, look at it fly! Hopefully it doesn't hit anyone. I mean, it's solid stone. It probably weighs the same as Billy the Fridge. Nah, I'm kidding. It probably weighs less than that guy. The crowd all go around the king, looking inside the coffin, though I'm pretty sure Kirby has no idea what is going on. Tiff is alarmed, saying that it can't be right, as the camera turns to reveal... Oh my. Oh my. What is oh. Okay, now, two things. Firstly, there are no finger joints on that hand. How the heck would he be able to hold a hammer, let alone move his hands? But on a more positive note, I like how they made the beak a different color from the bone. As you'll often see that on real life bird skulls. And I really appreciate that level of detail because you see beaks are not actually made of bone. They're covered in a layer of keratin sort of similar to humans' fingernails. Therefore, when they die, they are a different color than, say, the actual bone in a skeleton. So, yeah, you know, they kind of even each other out, those two notes I just said. Also, the music and the Japanese reveal of the body is actually better than the one in the English dub. Here, let me just show you that right quick. <laughs> Eskorgoon walks through the crowd, claiming he has talent, and exclaims that the skeleton is a dead ringer for Didi. Get it? Dead ringer? <laughs> That's actually funny. In a lowbrow manner. Chef Kawasaki here then says that there was never any Cappy King in the good old days. 
Chief Bookums, who is rather annoyed at the news, says that there wasn't no good old days either. This, which I mean, were all the DDD clan as bad as the current King DDD? Like, does Chief Bookums know more of the DDD's kind? And if so, were they that bad? I mean, if so, why don't the people here know more about the DDD clan? And if he's lying and just basing that statement off the current king, well, that's bigger than his heck. Again, man, these pea brains are just so tolerant of this horrible rule. And this episode opens so many questions about the history of the civilization. Man, it's weird. DDD is happy as this discovery legitimizes his rule over Capitown. Tiff rejects these findings, to which DDD scoffs and says, the artifacts prove his rule. Though, one dead individual doesn't really prove a legacy as long as his claiming to be. I mean, seriously, again, man, according to Escargoon, he has ruled for over a million years. A single body, while well, it is evidence, is not enough to suggest a rule that long. Unless this body dates back to back then, which I would be amazed if the coffin survived that long. But anyway, then Escargoon makes this statement. Yes, it's a captivating discovery. Excellent. I want to tear my singular eye out. Thank you for that terrible pun, Escargoon. He then congratulates a very nervous and shy Curio. Trying to earn even more favor slash legitimacy, DDD then says to the group that they can take any DDD clan artifact they find around the dig site. Easily swayed and being egged on by Escargoon, the Cappy townsfolk Get right into excavating various artifacts. Come on, chop, chop. Well, guess the king's really king just like he said he was. That skeleton looks just like him, only skinnier. Dude, these people are so freaking easily led. No wonder the DDD clan conquered them. I feel no empathy for these morons. Seriously, people, this is ridiculous. Tip is smart enough to be skeptical and asks Professor Kiro whether the Cappy town was started by Cappies and whether or not Cappies started Cappies civilization. To which Kiro answers that the find of Didi's relative proves his hypothesis mistaken. Seizing the opportunity, Didi gloats about how his relatives always ruled this place. Then he desecrates the skeleton of his own ancestor, talking about not respecting the dead. Tiff, Kirby, and the gang all look annoyed until they are called by Kawasaki, who exclaims to have discovered something. Something. It's an old-fashioned Halloween mask. Oh, yeah. Firstly, that's obviously not a Halloween mask. The Japanese original has him say it belongs to an ancient king. In either case, it's clearly based off the Aztec tradition of golden masks. Gangu also finds an artifact, which he claims is even amazing as it's a yeah well look what i got it's a poster made of rock and it's monogrammed in contrast the japanese original has him say it's just a portrait signed by one of the king's ancestors i like the change because it makes gengu seem even dumber than he is which he is very dumb also note how this artifact is of a completely different style than the mask, being based on the early Renaissance style. Hint, hint. Am I right? In the background, we see a generic Cappy find a vase with a DDD clan emblem on it. It's too generic for me to assign to a specific archaeological reference. And another generic Cappy finds another generic artifact, which is a goblet with a hammer emblem which, again, I cannot assign to a specific archaeological style just because it's so generically designed. 
even old grumpy bookums finds a thingamajig. It's called a pacifier in the Japanese original. Kinda weird. With all this, DDD starts dancing with his dead relative, which again, as I say, it's kind of creepy and disrespectful, as Eskrigan cries about the artifacts. Dede even sings with the skeleton in the English dub. It was lacking in the Japanese original, and um, it's really kind of odd. Anyway, the king is in such a good mood, he even lets the cappies take whatever they find. Man, he's really profiting off the death of his ancestors, isn't he? Curio, strangely depressed considering the huge archaeological find he discovered, sinks off back to his house. As he leaves, the camera pans left at an angle from Tiff to Kirby, and the camera stays on Kirby till he blinks. In the English dub, it just cuts directly to Kirby before fading away. This was likely done in order to save time as... American television was a lot more strict when it comes to fitting stuff within a specific time slot. And personally, I've never been a really big fan of that. But hey, it has to be done, I guess. So yeah, I mean, it's not really a form of censorship. It's just in order to make it more easily rewindable. Anyway, back to the plot. We then cut to Kyrgios' house where Tip is trying to cheer up him. The professor, who sulks and moans, depressed and cleaning an artifact, he brushes it off until Tiff reminds him of this. Besides, remember what you always say. The most important thing isn't to show your theories right, but to dig all the way to the truth. Now, Loosening up, he thanks Tiff and seems to feel happy as all the Cappies now are much more invigorated in their interest in archaeology. Also, can I just say how what Tiff just said has to be a really good line? I think even outside of context, it, it, it's good. As a token of his goodwill, he gives Tiff the Cappy arrowhead and says that they should go home, as he has some work to do. Overall, I really like this scene. It's short and not a big part of the episode, but... It will play a part later, and I just, I like how it's done. It is really heartwarming, and does give Curio some character that I think other people just tend to ignore when they're reviewing this episode. Back at her home, we see the Tiff family eating supper, but she's not, and noticing this, her father asks what's wrong. Her mom explains what happened up to this point, and Tuff mentions... How it's odd that all the other junk they found was made by Cappies until recently. Which, I mean, is a good point. But does that mean there was no artifacts at all of the DDD clan before this episode? What the heck? That just makes their rise to power even odder. Like, how recent was this? Like, simultaneously, there are no... Uh, artifacts but they're also powerful enough to be not known of a time beforehand like seriously what is this her father then says they must be legit as curio examined them himself and lady likes deems the matter settled looking at the spearhead tiff gets up in a huff and leaves to go back to curio Kirby then pops up to eat Tiff's leftover food, because of course he does. The guy just is attracted to food, and you're going to find him whenever there is food. Wandering out in the night, she sees Curio leaving his museum with a large stone object. Intrigued, she investigates, following him into the excavation site. In the Japanese origin. Well, after Tiff enters the cave, there's a scene in which the camera pans downwards on a massive cavern as Kiro walks in pulling the cart. The scene then cuts to him setting up the lights. In the English dub, the panning scene was cut in order to 
again, save time. And we just cut to him putting up the lights. The big reveal is then shown as we see Curio using his shovel to bury the artifact, proving it to be fake. Tiff is initially confused, but sees the large artifact that he is bearing. We'll return to that in a bit, though. Pulling out a camera, she takes photographs of the forgery. We then cut to the next day, where we see crowds gathering to see a huge DDD-esque artifact that resembles a Peruma doll. After <laughs> remarking on the similarities by Chief Bookums, Gangu asks why they don't call it the DDD stone. Kinda reminiscent to the Rosetta Stone-esque name. Annoyed at the whole hubbubaloo, Tiff asks to speak with Curio, and confused, the professor follows her to a side cave and asks what Tiff wants to talk about. In the Japanese original, she removes her backpack and shows the photos she took of his deception. In the English dub, it's cut, and so it's a much more abrupt reveal. A rather odd choice, but it's probably, again, due to the need to save time. But I do think it ruins the sort of transition. But, you know, that's probably not really all that important to some people. Tuff, who had alongside Kirby, followed the pair, grabbed a photo, and looked at it. Tiff explains the statue of forgery. Ashamed, she asks him why he did it. After Kiro who is so embarrassed he didn't answer her question. She said she was going to have to turn him in if he didn't stop. The three kids look at him all very disappointed. It's a very sad scene. While not immediately exposing him in the Japanese version, Tiff then threatens to expose him. While in the English dub, she just asks him to think about it. She goes to leave, but is stopped by Escargoon, who alongside with the king, corner the kids. They then tie and gag the kids and tell Kira to go out and do the speech they told him to do. Also, is it just me, or did the stone get smaller for the introduction? Escargoon introduces the speech in Kyrio. Kyrio then walks forward. With a great level of stress, he begins his presentation. He then has a flashback to the three kids looking at him, all disappointed. When he continues, he says that all the artifacts come from the DDD clan, and he continues only to hear the voice of Tiff once again in his mind. Reminding him th that. Remember what you always say the most important thing isn't to show your theories right, but to dig all the way to the truth. <laughs> this leads to him admitting the truth of his forgery, and the king's reaction of sliding down his chair is hilarious. Even more so is Escaradun's reaction. I mean, look at that face. Look at it. It's hilarious. Also, in the Japanese version, the line that Tiff says in his mind is actually completely different, instead being a flashback to when Tiff was talking to him in the museum, but with a brightness, things turned all the way up. And she also says for him to think about it and come to his own decisions in said flashback. My gosh, that is so bright. After that, he admits that all the artifacts were fake, and that he planted them much to everyone shock. Escargoon tries to stop him by claiming that he's going a little bonkers, but he pushes the snail back and continues his explanation. So, he did so because his antique shop was failing in business, and he was using up his life savings in his research in Akapi history. In desperation and destitute due to his lack of funds, he asked the king for some help in a very humble manner. The king, being the opportunistic 
meanie agrees to help, but only if the desperate professor quote-unquote found artifacts that supported his royal rule. Even Sir Ibram is shocked at the king's trickery and low-handedness. The professor then tosses the photos to the crowd, proving his claims and exposing the entire paleontological hoax. Everyone turns against the king, who tries to say the photos are phony, but then Tiff comes to support Curios' claims. Their parents are shocked, and Dee Dee asks how she escaped, to which this is the answer from a certain... Escape! You've done a low-down thing, your highness, holding these kids captive because they wanted the truth. Chief points out how that's not a crime, and that after Tiff pointing out how his abuse of Curio proves his illegitimacy to rule, the crowd turn against the king and try to overthrow him. By the way, this is the only time something even this extreme happens, and it's the only time he ever comes close to losing his rule. For real, though, I mean, despite proving himself unfit to rule, and the fact that he is illegitimate, the Cappy still serve him for the rest of the series, and never attempt to overthrow him. I mean, talk about Stockholm Syndrome. I mean, what is this? Diddy, annoyed at the sedation, calls upon his secret weapon, the Diddy Stone, which upon his command turns into a huge, older esque behemoth that resembles him except for odd pants. So where to begin with this villain of the week? Well, for starters, in Japanese, it's called Dedede Sutan, with Sutan being Japanese for stone, which means this is Japanese for Dedede Stone. This is one of the few monsters animated with CGI and... Man, is it terrible or what? I mean, it makes Jar Jar look good. Its mouth clips into its literal stone body. I mean, look at that. Look at it! Just horrible! It makes Dinah Blade look good, and even I criticize that. Perhaps more interesting is the fact that the stone's origins are not even explained. Was it a demon beast, like Tiff says? Was it created by Nightmare? How would she know? And in the English dub, that line was completely cut, indicating it wasn't that important. Was it maybe a legitimate artifact slash weapon of the DDD clan? If so, then I mean, where did it come from? If Kirio made it, and I doubt it, why would he give it the ability to transform? Well, share your thoughts on whether the DDD stone is one of Nightmare's creations, a fake by Kirio, a DDD relic, or something else entirely. I legitimately want to know. Regardless of the creature's origin, Dee Dee and Eskagoon ride the beast and order the CGI monstrosity to destroy Cappy Town and crush all that opposes rule. There's a cut scene in the Japanese original with Tiff and the gang hide behind a rock and what about how she says it's a demon beast. Tiff wonders where Professor Kirio is when we cut to Kira trying to attack the statue with his pickaxe, only to be stopped by the dust taken up from by the impact of the heavy Goliath. Tiff, Tuff, and Kirby try to run to him, but Tiff is almost crushed when she trips, and Dee Dee orders it to be step upon her. And she's only... Re Skewed by Meta Knight again. Whoa! Oh, Meta Knight. Run. That Meta Knight. I mean, gosh darn, is he overpowered in the anyway. This guy is able to hold up this stone behemoth. Like what? How? Now I know Meta he has always been powerful, but this is a bit much. Tiff gets. 
away while Medanite continues to hold up this giant Billy the Fridge sized monster. On her command, Kirby tries to inhale the stone beast, but for obvious reasons, that being size, this proves impossible. Dee Dee even points this out, but this challenge causes Kirio to stand up for once. He then rushes the stone behemoth and swings his peck axe, causing shards of stone to splinter off, giving Kirby what he needs to transform into stone Kirby. As always, this music is amazing. I mean, just listen to this. After that, Dee is confused, and Tiff points out how Curio helped Kirby to transform by doing shards. And the flashback is black and white in the English dub, which is good as it just kind of helps illustrate that it's a flashback. In the original anime, it's colored. Tiff points out what we just saw, thanks for doing my job, and Stone Kirby's increased strength allows him to judo kick the DD stone over, much to the cheers of those present. Kirby dances at this victory, but it's a short one, as a DD stone gets back up to fight again and tries to crush the pink buff fall between his big, stony mitts. Tiff is distressed, but DD and Escargoon cheer on the monster. Tiff then calls upon the Warp Star, and thanks to Kirby's resiliency, he escapes and leaps onto the Warp Star. The stone behemoth continues to chase after some cappies, but then is distracted and starts fighting against Kirby again. Luckily, Kirby is much faster than the beast in the air and goes so high before returning to his stone form. In the Japanese version, he exclaims Stone Kirby when he transforms, but in the dub, he remains silent, which is honestly much better. After slipping off the warp star, the stone Kirby slams into the DDD stone and goes from the skull all the way through into the butt. I can only assume this is painful as heck. Oddly, the statue breaks into a bunch of identical gray barracks when it dies, instead of a bunch of shards. I mean, that's kind of weird how it turns into a bunch of identical gray bricks. I just, I think that's kind of interesting. As the debris rains from the sky, Kiro gets the kids out of the way so that they're not buried. Meanwhile, the king and Eskrigoon stay behind to complain about the loss of their superstone only to get buried underneath the loads of rubble. Tuff ex explains that they'll never get out of that rubble, while Tiff asks if they should help the king get out, to which Kiro answers in a rather funny manner. Kiro! Oh, let them get themselves out! I'm through digging up fakes, especially dangerous ones! I'd rather stick with real cappy artifacts that reveal true history, if that's okay. Which is fair, I mean, the king was very mean to him, and I mean in the real world, such an event of hoaxing would ruin a man's archaeological career forever. But hey, I guess because he's the only archaeologist in the town, that these standards are much looser. Tuff even half-heartedly offers to help excavate future digs. Though naturally, he backs off from that and calls Kirby to come around. And once again, we see Kirby's rarely used floating ability as he flies up to join the group as they go back home for dinner. We then get a brief monologue from Mennonite, who says that with every fight, Kirby progresses in strength. I like the continuity we see in the anime, which is why you should see them in the original Japanese production order, even in the English dub, as we'll get to it soon, but the English dub does mix up some of the orders of episodes, and it really does kind of hurt the anime as a whole. 
The episode ends with the king uttering profanity in the Japanese original before asking Kirby to help them out. In the Japanese version, they offer him candy, while in the English dub, they promise not to attack him until they're freed. Honestly, not all that convincing, but Kirby in either version decides to be a kind soul and help the king out, despite the other's reaction and protest. And so the episode ends. Now that the plot's finished, how about that theme? Well, it's obviously a critique slash warning about the dangers of pseudo-archaeology and archaeological hoaxes. Indeed, the overall plot was based on an actual hoax called the Japanese Paleolithic hoax. Indeed, the similarities between the real-world case and the episode are quite significant, except for the ending, obviously. Much like the episode, a noted archaeologist, Sinichi Fukujimura, had planted Jomon pottery shards and other stone artifacts in the lower and middle Paleolithic layers. And much like this episode, he was exposed by damning photographs. Now, the ending is much different, of course. He got fired and his legacy ruined forever, whereas Kirio gets the second chance, which I guess because he was being bribed against his will by the king, but overall it's kind of weird. Now, I want to say this episode's skeptical message is really good because especially the manner in which it approaches the topic. You see, when it comes to a lot of modern pseudo-archaeological debunkers, they often repeat the same old manners in which they'll, they'll just call it racist and problematic, this stuff is. Whereas this episode, they go against it from a truther perspective and... And they state that it's wrong that what Kirio is doing because it's inaccurate and it's wrong. Now, I point this out because it's something that really needs to be done more. But you see, something being racist doesn't disprove it. In many instances, it's a worthless counter-argument. And the fact that this episode handled the topic better than some YouTubers do is quite telling. Also, I really just enjoyed all the various cultures referenced in the episode. I mean, the Aztecs, the early Renaissance, it's really quite beautiful. And I, I like how, even in these background things, that they're included. It, it's just, it's, it's really good. Overall, what are my thoughts in this episode? Well, I like the plot and themes, and also enjoyed how it developed one of the secondary characters, which does happen a lot in in other episodes, as they'll take one secondary character and focus on it. However, this is one of the few in the whole series in which Kyoto gets any attention. There is another, but it's not as significant. It's, however, a bit flawed, as it opens up this huge mystery box of how DD rose to power and his whole family and how that relates to the Cappies, but... I mean, I could do a whole video on just that topic, and in fact, I might sh save this idea for a future video, so look forward to that. Some people also say Kirio is a weak, boring character, but I don't know. I liked him good enough f for a secondary character. This episode really elevated him to a character that I actually cared about a little bit. I mean, he's a secondary character. He's never going to be as good as like a primary character. And for what he's meant to be, I have to say I like him. He's he he is perhaps my one of my favorite background characters for the Cappies. There are others that come close, but really none of them interest me as much as this guy. But they all do get their own development, and we'll see that later in the series. Anyway, I'm the Dark Master, and um, if you want a deeper than average episode, watch this one. I highly recommend it. Have a blessed day, everybody, and subscribe if you want more Kirby Ride by Catcher reviews.